Black Education in North Carolina. Virtues of the Past, Voices of the Present, Vision for the Future. Before the Civil War was declared in 1861, North Carolina, like most of the South, had only a rudimentary public school system, and the public school system that did exist was certainly off limits to the enslaved African Americans. Many plantation owners feared that if enslaved black Americans learned to read, they would prove to be a threat to the slave system by ultimately seeking their freedom. As such, the opposition to enslaved individuals obtaining literacy was enshrined in law in many states and here in North Carolina. The General Assembly prohibited anyone from teaching slaves to read or write in 1818 and would go on to pass stronger legislation, making it a crime. These laws were then enforced through violence, harassment, imprisonment, and even fines. And those who taught enslaved individuals to read were likewise penalized almost as harshly as the enslaved who pursued the education. But yet, the commitment to African Americans to learn to read and write never faltered. Despite the threat of punishment or death, many enslaved individuals covertly pursued their education. African Americans recognized the value of education, including the value of literacy as intrinsic to controlling their own destiny and the full citizenship denied to them under slavery, demonstrating the virtue of self-determination. It was the poor, desperate, newly freed African Americans who worked to build the foundations of a new system of universal public schooling and they did so with very limited resources and without the assistance from the federal government. This was the framework of the universal public school system that America enjoys today, but to say that African Americans did it alone would be irresponsible. As the African-American parents dug deep into their own scarce resources, black community leaders partnered up with northern abolitionists like the Freedmen's Bureau, white charities, and missionary societies to build and maintain their own schools. These were schools that met the needs and reflected the values of the black community and served as a catalyst to establish a tradition of educational self-help against all odds demonstrating the virtue of self-reliance. And black schools were springing up all over the South during the Reconstruction Era, the historic and transformative period in which the United States grappled with the question of how to integrate millions of newly freed African Americans into social, political, labor, and educational systems. Then there was the Freedmen's Bureau, created by Congress in 1865 to aid African Americans in the South and help provide hope for a better life. The Freedmen's Bureau would achieve many of its greatest accomplishments in the arena of education, where it seated more than 1,000 black schools in former Confederate states. In its short six years of operation, the Bureau concentrated over $7 million in today's purchasing power to establish teacher training institutions, convinced that the best means of ensuring a future for Southern black education was through the preparation of teachers for black schools. And oftentimes, these organizations collaborated and frequently worked in conjunction with one another. For example, the Freedmen's Bureau formed partnerships with the Christian-based abolitionist group American Missionary Association, who would add its own 500 historically black schools to the array of educational institutions dedicated to educating African Americans in the South, demonstrating the virtue of cooperation. These academic schools of excellence included institutions of higher learning like Clark Atlanta University, Fisk University, Hampton University, and Howard University. But one of its shining stars in the K-12 area would be the Peabody Academy in Troy, North Carolina. Peabody Academy, originally a boarding school that attracted African-American students from Montgomery County and surrounding rural areas, was established in 1880 as a missionary school and church for African-Americans. 
the American Missionary Association chose Troy, North Carolina for its location due to the high concentration of African Americans in the Montgomery County area. And they would send a white missionary from Massachusetts named Reverend William Ellis drawn to a noble cause to help educate the Negro in the South while spreading the virtues of Christianity. Reverend Ellis and the American Missionary Association were well aware that the large part of the success of a new school would require the support of the local community and its leadership. Local townsmen began to brainstorm and organize, and before long, a three-member board of trustees was formed for the purpose of partnering with the AMA to build new schools. The three members consisted of Peter Green, Alexander Powell, and James Cron. These early leaders were formerly enslaved men, led by the eldest, Peter Green, who would work alongside Reverend Ellis for the establishment of a new Negro school. After several years of planning, design, and organizing, a wooden church was built as well as the Negro school. The church was established as the first congregational church and the school was named Peabody Academy, demonstrating the virtue of ambition. Reverend Ellis became the school's first principal and also served as a minister of the church. The early teachers were two African-American sisters, Annie and Carrie Smitherman, who were enslaved prior to the Civil War. But it would take an African by the name of Orishatuka Fajuma, the son of Yoruba parents, to transform Peabody Academy into an institution of excellence. My name is Orishatuka Faduma. I am a husband, father, teacher, minister, and advocate for African culture. I'm also the third principal of the esteemed all-black school, Peabody Academy in Troy, North Carolina. I was born in 1855 to my honorable parents, John and Omolofi Faduma. I want to tell you a little about my parents. They were members of the African village in Yoruba land a cultural region in West Africa that spans the modern-day countries of Nigeria, Togo, and Benin. My parents were captured and were on the verge of being sold as slaves to the United States when the British Navy recaptured them on a slave ship in the Atlantic Ocean. They eventually ended up in the British Guiana, South America. This is where I was born on September 15, 1855. I attended school in one of the leading Christian establishments in the colony, the Methodist Boys High School, founded as the Wesleyan Boys High School. I excelled in high school and earned multiple academic achievements. Later, I traveled to England to further my education, and I hold the distinction of being the first West African student to earn a Bachelor's of Arts degree from the University of London in 1884. In 1891, I traveled to the United States to further my education as one of the few Africans to do so. I was fortunate enough to be the first African student to enroll at Yale Divinity School. I persevered and studied hard to earn a bachelor's degree in theology from the prestigious Ivy League school and continued my postgraduate studies there until I graduated and I received a Master in Divinity in 1895. I was closely associated with the African Methodist Episcopal Church. It was the AME Church, the first separate religious denomination for black Americans, that ordained me as a minister. But I was also able to build a strong affiliation with the leadership of American Missionary Association. This put me on the unlikely path of landing in Troy, Montgomery County, North Carolina. The AMA founded more than 500 schools and colleges for the freed of the South during and after the Civil War. One of those Negro schools in the South was Peabody Academy in Troy, North Carolina. Peabody Academy was an outstanding all-black institution established in 1880. In 1895, I relocated to Montgomery County, North Carolina, where I was not only appointed the principal of the Peabody Academy, but I also became the pastor for the Congregational Church, also affiliated with the AMA. The Negro Boarding School attracted eager students not only from the surrounding rural areas of the town of Troy, but also the surround towns of Bisco, Mount Gilead, Kanda, and Star. Under my leadership, Peabody Academy succeeded in her studies. 
Fujuma was persuasive, energetic, and witty. And in Peabody, he found a living laboratory where he could put all of his experiences and progressive Christianity to test. He would serve at Peabody Academy for almost 20 years in an era that he himself described as the period of self-help. All white instructors who had previously been in charge of the academy had been replaced by African Americans following the policy of the American Missionary Association to raise leaders among the people who could continue the work of the missionaries. During this golden age for the rural North Carolina Negro School, Fajuma slowly and meticulously overhauled the curriculum at Peabody Academy into a prestigious program of industrial and economic arts. Another major contribution was bringing the teachings of West African thinkers to the attention of the rural black American blacks while applying cultural nationalism. Principal and Pastor Fajuma would serve Peabody Academy and the community of Troy along with its surrounding areas until 1914, but he left an illustrious legacy. Peabody Academy would continue to showcase his model curriculum and his superior teaching methods for another half century. Following the blueprint of Reverend and Principal Fajuma, Peabody Academy became widely recognized as one of the most prestigious high schools in the Carolinas. This was due in large part to how Reverend Fajuma and all of his successors were able to weave the ideology of Booker T. Washington into the fabric of Peabody Academy by concentrating on elevating black students through hard work and self-reliance. Washington argued that African Americans must concentrate on educating themselves, learning useful trades, and investing in their own businesses. Hard work, economic process, as well as merit, he believed, would prove the value of the formerly enslaved to the American society and its economy. Many African American scholars objected to this type of curriculum as they felt that the college preparatory education should be made available for black children. However, Peabody Academy was strongly devoted to Booker T. Washington's school of thought. Vocational education would be paramount for preparing the rural black students for immediate employment, thus providing them with better opportunities in life. So Peabody Academy continued teaching and training the young men in agriculture, carpentry, blacksmithing, brick masonry, sawmilling, and mechanics. They continued teaching the young women in nursing, cooking, basketry, sewing, and housekeeping. The virtues of the past self-determination, self-reliance, courage, Christianity, and cooperation became the building blocks for what turned into a spectacular education system for black Americans in Montgomery County who would literally go out and change the nation. And if you ask any Peabody alumni, they would all express the same sentiment, that Peabody Academy was a community school with all elements of the local neighborhood. Peabody was more than just a school. It was a great part of the village. It was a large percentage of the community. Peabody is bigger than the academy. Peabody is a culture. It is what, it is the culture that caused us to become entrepreneurs. It's the culture that taught us how to be independent of systems. Um, I think at some point it has been buried, so it is good that intercessors people that are interconnecting can bring, breathe the life back into it. So, yes, I think it's of the utmost importance that we document it, that we continue to work in the vein of that energy that Dr. Fatima created when he was at Peabody. After the U.S. Supreme Court made the landmark decision to desegregate schools in the historic Brown versus Board of Education, Racial segregation in public schools were considered unconstitutional in 1954. In Montgomery County, the ruling was initially met with inertia by the Board of Education and blatant resistance by the white parents. But integration would slowly and eventually bring out major changes to the Montgomery County public school system, like other school systems across the country. Montgomery County built two new high schools to facilitate the new integration laws brought down by the Supreme Court. And on March 28, 1968, the Montgomery County School Board voted to close Peabody School and send the elementary students from Peabody to Troy Elementary School. High school-age students from Peabody would have to enroll in one of the two new high schools, East or West Montgomery High School, depending on the district where they lived. Peabody Academy leaves a legacy that we are working diligently to preserve and promote. The school's well-educated teachers developed generations of high-achieving African Americans spread all over the nation. 
Despite being racially segregated by law and existing at the height of Jim Crow in rural North Carolina, Peabody Academy was able to overcome enormous challenges that did not stop the local black community from rallying for the cause of educating their children. I, Sherry Harris, all good, do solemnly swear that I will support and maintain the Constitution and laws of the United States, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of my office as mayor. So help me God. Amen. Amen. 